is a picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Shalom. Welcome back to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss. Today's episode is going to be divided up into a few chunks, but I think that you'll enjoy it and learn from it. First off, we're going to hear from my dad, Dr. Randy Weiss. He keeps a journal that he's been keeping for as long as I can remember, and he takes notes about the things that God tells him and the things God has done in his life. Dad's going to share with us a few of those thoughts from his journal, and then we'll transition to a segment where we listen in on our conversation that my dad had with our friend, John Cathcart. I'll tell you a little bit more about that and, uh, when we get a little bit closer to it. But for now, let's hear what my dad's thoughts are and what God spoke to him through that journal is. Words matter. We all know this is true and some of us use words well, some of us use them poorly. Some of us use words as tools. Some of us use words as weapons. Some of us use words in one way on one day, and then we use them differently on a different day or in a different situation. Words matter. And words have meaning. When I was a teenager, if someone was really respected or, or perhaps feared, we said he was bad, but we really meant he was good. If someone said you were really bad, or that was a bad car or a bad guitar, it meant the opposite. It was a great compliment. And since we all used the words in the same way, we all understood bad meant good. Therefore, there was no confusion in our circles. If you were called bad, we all understood it meant really good. However, there were also some violent people in our circles, and gangs were uh, in existence in Gary, Indiana, where I grew up. And if someone became known as a bad dude, well, bad took on a an altered connotation. As you might imagine, it suddenly meant something other than good. And there was some especially bad dudes in my hometown. Envision, if you will, bad, bad Leroy Brown from the Jim Croce song that, you know, many people are familiar with, where he famously described the South Chicago streets of the early 1970s people feared the baddest dude in town. In the 1960s and the early 1970s, some of the uh, bad, bad South Chicago boys were still learning to be really bad from the worst South Side Gary boys. Words matter. My parents were sometimes confused by the nomenclature that we used. A bad car, a bad guitar, or a bad concert were all the opposite of what they understood. It was clear to us, but it was confusing to those who were the uninitiated. We knew to be far out was the perfect place to be, but far out may have seemed lost to those who had not expanded their minds. Far out was where we wanted to be, but it's not always where our parents might have wanted us to be. Of course, with our far out mindset and our mind expanding experiences, allowing dangerous and illegal hallucinogenics or mind numbing narcotics to enter our daily lives, words took on new meanings. It was far out until bad meant really bad, such as in a bad trip. 
to most people, a trip was a vacation or perhaps a short fall, but a bad trip was something very bad from which some of us never quite returned intact. Words matter. Years ago, my kids began using the word awesome. They used it for everything. And it might have been an awesome car or an awesome guitar or an awesome event. But I decided to reflect on that. And likewise, my grandchildren did the same. They would use the term awesome. And I decided it was an improper use of the word. And so I suggested that God alone is awesome. Perhaps we should reserve that word for a description of God. You see, if everything is awesome, then nothing is really awesome. If a car is awesome and God is awesome, that either elevates a car or depreciates God to the level of something merely impressive until it rusts out or ends up obsolete, broke down, perhaps in a museum or in a junkyard. God is awesome. Everything else is okay, cool, bad, good, great, interesting, pretty, ugly, or whatever. I love my kids and my grandkids, and I remain tolerant. By the way, what is tolerance today? Words matter. Words have meaning. Anyone with an ear to hear realizes that words have been used by many groups of people in very different ways. I know what tolerance means to me, and I want people who disagree with my views of life and godliness to be tolerant of me and allow me to live my life and express my views without harming or silencing me. They want the same. P people want tolerance. No requirement exists to agree. I don't have to agree with you. You don't have to agree with me, but we can be tolerant of one another. We can all be friends and, I don't know, play nice together, even if we see things differently. And I think that exemplifies true tolerance. However, some interpret the word tolerant in an expanded, kind of twisted way. It's sometimes confused with a requirement to agree or to support a belief system or lifestyle with which we may genuinely disagree. I support a way of life that allows us to be different, yet respected enough to allow each other to pursue life according to what we believe. I see no need for you to agree with me or to celebrate my views if you disagree. And if I'm an honest person, if I'm intellectually honest and I have integrity, uh, I have to allow you to be different than me. I must reciprocate if I am tolerant. I want to be free to believe and act in the ways that I genuinely believe. And I want not to be accepted, just to be allowed to be me. I must be tolerant of you and reciprocate and let you be you, even if I disagree with your choices. I mean, that doesn't include me harming you or you harming me. That's off the table. It's not intolerant to say, nope, that doesn't work. That's just being real. I shouldn't demean you with my words or my actions. 
and I'd enjoy the same courtesy from people of tolerance. It would be nice if you didn't demean me or harm me. Words matter, and God alone is awesome. I like what a modern translation of the Bible says about our words. The message paraphrases what Paul instructed, quote, Say only what helps, each word a gift. I love that, each word a gift. May God help us to use our words as gifts, not weapons. Let our words be tools to elevate and to build others up on a good foundation. Let our words be blessings, not curses. Paul continued. He said, Though some tongues just love the taste of gossip, those who follow Jesus have better uses for language than that. Don't talk dirty or silly. That kind of talk doesn't fit our style. It says thanksgiving is our dialect. Words matter. Whether or not we agree, we can respect each other, and we should respect each other enough as human beings all facing the challenges and struggles of life to be genuinely tolerant with showing basic human kindness. I think this is appropriate and required of us if we are tolerant. And we can have enough compassion for each other to allow for our differences. We don't have to agree, but we can allow for our differences. You may not believe in God, and I believe in him so much that I'm convinced he loves you and me even with our differences. So what does that mean? And what am I asking? What am I expecting of myself and of you? I think we should learn to hate the taste of gossip enough to not traffic in gossip. I follow Jesus. I will humbly ask, do you follow Jesus? If so, may God help us find the better uses for our language that He desires. May we learn to communicate God's love instead of our own disdain for those with whom we differ. That takes a step of intentionality. It takes a step of faith. It takes a step of the will, a choice. God forbid that we would sink into the mire of using our words to demean others or to diminish things that are holy. God help us avoid depreciating the joyous things of life intended by God for our pleasure and our procreation. Our happiness and joy need not be discounted. We can celebrate the immense values of life and godliness without deteriorating into silliness. And, you know, our goal should be to grow into mature men and women of God by escaping the buffoonery and finally fitting our thoughts and our words into a lifestyle of thanksgiving. Let it be true of us. Let God help us to let thanksgiving be our dialect. I'm not there. But that's where I want to be, and I hope it's not too far out. <laughs> Till next time, shalom. Did you know that leprosy still exists? That's why a few years ago, 
we worked with World Missionary Evangelism to create a leper clinic here in India where we provide the medicines and food and the gospel on a daily basis. One thing we found was that the children of leper patients were contracting the disease as well because they get the disease through regular daily contact over long periods of time. So we worked with WME to create a children's home where the children of these leper patients could live nearby their family, but give them a hope and a future free of the disease. Would you consider sponsoring one of these children? Would you consider helping to give them a hope and a future? For just $25 a month, you can give that hope. You can provide that future. Less than a dollar a day. Give us a call at 1-800-688-3422. Next up, we're going to look back at that conversation between my dad and our friend, Dr. John Cathcart. John has helped us uh, directly with our ministry called Today with God. It takes the, the Bible in video form and translates it into many languages around the world. And then distributes it to the believers around the world so that they can expand the kingdom of God. John's helped us specifically with our efforts in India. And that's what you're gonna get a chance to hear him discuss. I'm going to let them take it from there. So uh, if you'd like to learn more, uh, just visit us online, crosstalk.org, and you can find more information about Today with God there. So you know what we're doing. You know why we're doing it. You have personally dug deep to help us yourself. And the organization you, you led, uh, you, you've, you've helped us. Why? Well, I think Josh, your son Josh, came to me one stage of the game. You know, my memory in some of these areas is, uh, is faint. But Josh came and talked to me about the project and was telling me what he thought it would cost and so on and so forth. And I thought, here is an opportunity to take the gospel to millions of people, 500 million or more. And I thought, well, what an opportunity. So I'm glad that I went with the estimate that Josh gave at that time, because it's probably cost you much more since then. But I felt to give a tenth of what he estimated the cost to be, a tithe. Uh, because I want to be able to say, Randy, that I played a role in getting, it was 500 million and I played a role in getting the gospel to 50 million people. Now, how many people, how many can say that? And, and, you know, I'd say to your staff, you're involved in something much, much bigger than you can ever realize. You'll never know. Only eternity will reveal the significance and the scope and the extent of what you are doing. You don't know, you don't have a clue as to how important this is. Let me tell you, India is a powerful, powerful nation. And I've worked in the North and, and um, you know, we have viewed this kind of thing, the kind of works we do as opening the door to the gospel. And I have uh, been involved in the in leper ministry, ministry with lepers, and involved with the first prenatal, postnatal care clinic in Bangladesh. And these are all opportunities to bring the gospel to people who otherwise might never meet the Lord. And you know, I always like the story of the uh, the man that went to heaven and what the Novary's mansion was. 
So St. Peter, poor old St. Peter, he gets the blame for everything. St. Peter said, let me lead you and show you. So he passed some of these fabulous mansions and, and said, who does that belong to? Oh, T.D. Jakes. Well, who does that one belong to? And some other prominent minister. And then he took him to a, a broken down shack. And he says, this is your place. And the man said, this is my place. What do you mean? He said, man, you're lucky to get this built for you with as little as you sent on ahead of you. Okay. So we're investing in God. We're investing in the kingdom. We're investing in men's souls. And one thing that the great missionary to India said so many years ago, can't think of his name off the top of my head, but in what they called the Sarampur Agreement, they all agreed on the inestimable, inestimable value of one single soul. The inestimable, inestimable value of one single soul. There was a great preacher called Mordecai Ham. And Mordecai Ham was famous. Uh, had some interesting beliefs, but fantastic man. So he held a meeting. And at this meeting, you know, we all know Baptists know how to get people bring the gospel message. He had a meeting and only one person came to the Lord. One! Billy Graham. Praise the Lord. Billy Graham. So you don't know. I, I heard a story about a man that God spoke to us here in the United States. And he said, I want you to go down to the railroad yard and preach to the trucks. Now, there is a railroad mixing center. I think it's in New Mexico, but you've never seen anything like it. We're getting alerted by, the, by a threatened strike to the significance of railroads. But this place, you've never seen so many railroad tracks in all your life. Well, he said he felt like a fool. But, obedient to the Lord, down to the railroad, he went and in the middle of the night preached to the trucks, the railroad cars. But what he didn't know was there was a man who later became one of the greatest evangelists in the United States that heard that message. So the inestimable, inestimable value of one single soul. I mean, when men like this get saved, the world is affected. And Randy, TWG is affecting the world for Christ. It's affecting the world. Man, you get a few million Indians saved and wait and see what happens. They're an industrious, intelligent people and you'll be flabbergasted at what happens. You know, God is fulfilling what he's called us to do. We have made the most remarkable progress in these things have taken so very long and cost so very much. And at any point, if God would have told us it's going to take this long or cost that much, we would have been too, just too afraid. Randy, you know what we used to say in the engineering business? And we were involved in billion dollar projects. The expert in the room is the guy that says it'll take the longest and cost the most. Okay? Yeah. It'll take the longest and cost the most. And if you could see the, if you could see the scope of the challenge ahead of time, you'd never go there. I, I think of the disciples. You know, good grief. Jesus picks 12 known entities. And you look at these men, and these are not the kind of men 
that threaten the systems of this world. And you, you know, you think of Jesus calling them and you think, hey, this ain't going to go anywhere. This is a hopeless situation. These guys can, can, you know. <laughs> They'd mess up a one car funeral. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, but look at the results. And, and you realize, you know, Jesus said some things that absolutely were just crushing. You haven't chosen me. I've chosen you. Well, that takes, that takes away any honor we have. You haven't chosen me. I've chosen you. The one that always amused me, amused me was when the Lord said to the disciples, I mean, it's so true. He said, without me, you can do nothing. <laughs> without me, isn't, isn't that flattering? I mean, doesn't that make you feel good about yourself? And that's just the truth. Without me, you can do nothing. You haven't chosen me. I have chosen you. And so, Randy, there's nothing greater than the call of God on our life. I mean, if you are chosen by the Lord, that's fantastic. God is in the business of bringing many sons to glory. Okay? And to as many as believed in him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to as many as believed into his name. We're putting on Christ, and you don't do that in five minutes. You, when I was a kid, a teenager in a church, you know, we used to, you know, God is all I need. We said it, and we knew we were lying, but live a while, and the day will come when he is everything to you, where the Lord becomes everything to you, and you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. Forgive up this idea that you're not going to suffer. The Lord said concerning Paul, I'll show him what things he must suffer for my name's sake. We're going to suffer. Get used to the idea. But I like what Corrie ten Boom said, you know, the Netherlands lady, World War II, Nazis. She said, you'll never know that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. Man alive. My prayer is that we can all know that Christ is all that we need. If you need prayer, or if there's something you'd like for us to be lifting up on your behalf, reach out to us at crosstalk.org. Give us a call at 1-800-688-3422. And of course, as always, uh, we appreciate your, your tax-deductible contributions. So please help us continue this ministry in whatever way God leads. Until next time, shalom and God bless.